Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's hard to believe that an entire year has gone by since we last met, but maybe that just proves the old adage that time flies when you're having fun. Because I've had a lot of fun over the last year searching for and finding Oxfordian materials from the first decades of the Oxfordian era. I made three trips to England in search of them and would like to recount for you, in somewhat chronological order, the places I visited and some of the many interesting things I found. So, one year and one hour. We'll have to move quickly. <laughs> Ready? Here we go. All right, by the time of our last conference, I had uncovered 15 long lost shorter pieces that John Thomas Looney had published after Shakespeare identified. I also had leads on additional pieces that I hadn't been able to find in the United States either in online databases or in large research uh, libraries like the one at Duke University. So I knew I had to go to England to search for them, and that's what I did. Soon after the conference, I went to London for one week, uh, primarily to examine publications in the British Library, but also to see what might be in the Oxfordian archives at Brunel University without knowing too much about what to expect in either place. Now, I had heard that the Hackney Spectator had run many Oxfordian articles, so it was among the first publications that I requested at the British Library. I was thrilled to discover that it was all true. The Hackney Spectator had run 148 Shakespeare Fellowship columns over a period of two and a half years until the paper folded in 1925. The columns reported on ongoing Oxfordian research and other topics of special interest to anyone interested in the Shakespeare authorship question. Then something happened that I hadn't expected. I found that one of the articles in the Hackney Spectator had been written by John Thomas Looney. Then I found a second by him, and then a third. In all, Looney had written about 20 of the articles in that paper, which more than doubled the number of long lost shorter pieces by him that I had found. I now had the full text of about 38 such pieces. Then I discovered that the East Anglian magazine, which I knew had run a few pieces by Percy Allen and other Oxfordians, had actually run an Oxfordian page in every issue from August 1937 until the magazine ceased publication during the Second World War. This was all tremendously exciting, but even more exciting things were to come at Brunel University. Now, Brunel houses the archives of the Shakespeare Fellowship from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s which are now part of the Shakespearean Authorship Trust archives. It also houses the papers of the De Vere Society. These materials, articles, letters, organizational records, and books <coughs> fill seven bookcases with six shelves each. So that's 42 shelves of Oxfordian materials. Almost immediately after arriving at Brunel, the two red albums pictured on the right caught my eye. They're dated 1922 to 1929 and 1930 to 1936. So I set the first one out on the table and opened it. I was thrilled to see that it was filled with Oxfordian ephemera. Every page had articles and letters and other items pasted onto them, more than 100 pages in each album, totaling more than 500 pieces of Oxfordian ephemera, most of which do not exist anywhere else in the world. One of the most surprising findings in the Red Albums was that the Shakespeare Fellowship issued circulars to its members beginning at the time the fellowship was formed in 1922. These circulars were the main way that the fellowship kept its members informed about Oxfordian research activities and publications <laughs> for more than a decade before the newsletter was launched in 1937. Until I found these, I had had no idea that the fellowship had issued any circulars or any other publications before the newsletter. The circular shown here from 1928 alerts members to upcoming lectures in London by Abel Lefranc. The circular on the right uh, reports on the fellowship's first year's work uh, in 1923. Uh, Sir George Greenwood pictured there was the president of the fellowship uh, for its first few years. And on the right, we have the membership list from 1924. Also in the Red Albums are dinner cards from various Shakespeare Fellowship dinners. The one shown here is from the very first Fellowship dinner on April 12, 1930. A couple of weeks after the dinner was held, 
Colonel Bernard R. Ward commented on it in a letter to Gerald Rendall, saying, Ernest Allen was witty, but some of it was undoubtedly due to champagne. <laughs> Percy Allen was not quite happy about him. They were twin brothers and somewhat ineffectually tried to put on the brakes. It was all enough to make Marjorie Bowen somewhat wild and haggard by the time she had to make her speech, which I thought was not the least happy of the many speeches of the evening. So our illustrious predecessors have set a fine example for us to follow in our own nighttime revels. All right, from the archives, I learned a great deal about Colonel Bernard Roland Ward that I hadn't known before. We owe a great deal to him. He was the driving force behind the creation of the Shakespeare Fellowship. Yes, Looney discovered Oxford's authorship, but it was Colonel Ward who founded the Oxfordian movement. He was the first active Oxfordian researcher after Looney, and he published the first Oxfordian book after Looney's two books. It was he who convinced the Hackney Spectator to run the fellowship columns, which he edited, and it was he who prepared and sent out the, Shakespeare fe or the, uh, the fellowship circulars. Without him, there would have been no institutional support for the Oxfordian idea, and individuals who had been persuaded by Looney's book might have remained just that, isolated individuals. It was Colonel Ward who brought them together to form a real Oxfordian community. And we owe a debt to Gilbert Standen, a name not well known today. At first, it was a mystery who compiled those two red albums. Who was it, I wondered, who had dedicated years of his life to gathering together all those materials and pasting them into the red albums, thus preserving them for future generations? Then I noticed that the 50 letters pasted into the albums were all addressed to Mr. Standen. And then I noticed that the 1930s album ended in 1936, a date coinciding with uh, Gilbert Standen's death. So he was most likely the compiler. Now, on that first visit to Brunel, I got so caught up in examining those two red albums, I had almost no time to explore the rest of Brunel's Oxfordian holdings. So I knew I had to get back to England as soon as I possibly could. I'm grateful to the SOF's Research Grants Committee for providing a grant on short notice that enabled me to get back to London to continue my work only a few, a few months later. The second trip lasted 17 exhausting days as I worked as fast as I could practically every waking minute to get through the materials at Brunel University to explore the Catherine E. Egger archives at the Senate House Library at the University of London and to conduct further research at the British Library. I went to Brunel first and almost immediately made another exciting discovery. We're all familiar with Captain Bernard M. Ward's biography, the 17th Earl of Oxford. Here's an advertisement for it on the right, a run on the Shakespeare Fellowship page of the Shakespeare Pictorial. Note that the ad includes excerpts from six reviews of the book. Now, I had searched for the full text of those reviews for years and had, never, and had found only three of them. I was despairing of ever finding the other three. Even the British Library didn't have copies of the periodicals in which they had appeared. But then, at Brunel, almost immediately upon arriving, I found the notebook on the, the left here, into which had been pasted reviews of Ward's book about 20 reviews or so, including those I hadn't been able to find anywhere else. On the right is one of those reviews. It's the first page of a long and substantive review of Ward's book that appeared in one of the long lost publications, TP's Weekly. Now TP's Weekly is not included in any online database. It's never been indexed. It's not on microfiche. Print copies are not in the holdings of the British Library. As far as I can tell, this copy of this important review is the only copy still in existence, and it's in the archives at Brunel University. Here's another surprising finding. We all know that Admiral Hubert Holland, later um, president of the Shakespeare Fellowship, wrote the book Shakespeare, Oxford, and Elizabethan Times, published in 1933. But he wrote a second volume of the book in 1946, it's the red uh, notebook there. It has never been published and exists only in one handwritten copy in Brunel's archives. What else is there? More than 40 Oxfordian pamphlets. Who knew Oxfordians had written so many? Here are two by Catherine Egger, 
Uh, the third one is especially important, Edward Johnson's The Shakespeare Quiz, which consists of 100 questions for Stratfordians to answer. <laughs> It was prepared in 1950, revised in 1964, and sadly, it's still relevant today. <laughs> Here are three more pamphlets uh, by famous names, uh, Gerald Rendell, Captain Bernard M. Ward, and uh, Charles Wisner Burrell. Here are brochures about the Shakespeare Fellowship with information on the organization, the Oxfordian claim, and a list of the lectures to be given during the upcoming year. And two more brochures uh, put out by the uh, Devere Society. Now, the first image shown here is of an important 80-page booklet, The Shakespeare Identity Crisis, which is chock full of interesting information. It was probably written by Helen Sear, though it doesn't say that. It's a bit odd, though, that although this important booklet was published by the Shakespeare Oxford Society in the United States, I, an American member of that American organization, had to travel to another country, to the archives of another organization, to find out about and obtain a copy of that uh, pamphlet or booklet. I photographed all 80 pages and reproduced a copy of it here. Uh, so if anyone would like to see it, I'll put it out on a table. You can take a look at it later. All right, we mustn't tarry any longer at Brunel because there's so much more to see elsewhere. The Catherine E. Egger archives at the University of London were a big surprise. Egger was one of the most important of the first generation of Oxfordians, yet she is among the least known today. Her archives consist of 28 boxes of materials, most of it Oxfordian. The material includes 95 Oxfordian letters, 38 booklets, pamphlets, flyers, and so on, and the manuscripts of dozens of talks she gave on Oxfordian subjects, but never published. She spent decades writing a book, The Life of Edward de Vere, that was also never published. The manuscript is in her archives, intact, waiting to be resurrected. One of the most important parts of the Egger archives is the letters from John Thomas Looney to her, uh, about 30 of them, which makes her archives the biggest collection of Looney's letters known to exist. Here's a quick look at their correspondence stretching over at least 16 years. Now, I mentioned that Catherine Egger uh, is among the most important of the first generation of Oxfordians. In support of that statement, I want to read part of a letter that Looney wrote to her in uh, September 1935. He wrote, Dear Miss Egger, I feel that I cannot wait until I have more carefully studied your paper on Oxford and the Queen's Revels to say how very deeply I have been impressed by the first reading of it. You have certainly struck a vein of research of the utmost importance and worked it with exceptional skill. You seem to carry investigation into the wonderful phenomenon of Elizabethan dramatic literature right to its roots as it has never been done before. For the first time, we see the seed and seedling stages of a great tree that all other writers have presented to us as a kind of miraculous sudden appearance of a full-grown plant of huge dimensions. So you can see, in addition to the, the, the unique way that Looney expresses himself, that Catherine Egger and her writings deserve to be much better known than they are today. By the way, two years ago, I had never heard of Catherine Egger. I learned of her and her work from Tom Goff, a longtime Oxfordian who lives near Sacramento, California. Now, many of the books in the archives at Brunel University contain inscriptions by their authors and annotations and inserts. You'd never know these things were there until you opened the books. The article on the right, pasted into one of Colonel Douglas's books, contains information about an important event in Douglas's life that I would never have known about if not for that article. And you can see that the book itself comes from Gilbert Stanton's collection. So one more reason that we should be grateful to him. And here are annotations, notes, and inserts in Catherine Egger's copy of Shakespeare Identified. Uh, the image on the right is a new, whoops, there we go. The image on the right is a new photograph of John Thomas Looney that I had never seen before. 
and that until I found it tucked into the, uh, her copy of uh, Shakespeare Identified, you know, probably very few people alive today have ever seen. So these two slides show the importance of examining every book in the Brunel and Egger archives. I had only begun to do that when time ran out, so I hope to return to London next year to finish that work and also to uh, begin several new lines of investigation. Now my third trip was the longest, lasting four full weeks. It was the most extensive with research conducted in many places. I flew into Heathrow and immediately took the train to the Bodleian Library at Oxford. After a week there, I took the train all the way up to Newcastle in the north. There I rented a car so that I could explore the area where Looney was um, born and raised and lived and worked. I also drove up to Scotland to meet his grandson, then drove down to Hull University, which had, has a letter from Looney in its history center, then drove on to Liverpool. From there, I took the train back to London. It was quite an adventure. Now, the Gerald H. Rendell archives at the University of Liverpool consists of six boxes filled with hundreds of important Oxfordian materials, including letters, clippings, and other items not found anywhere else. One item is the text of a speech that Ava Turner Clark gave at the Colony Club in New York in 1936. Her speech was actually an introduction for Percy Allen, who was on a speaking tour of the United States and Canada. And here's a monograph that Rendall prepared uh, comparing eight um, signatures, eight, of sign eight examples of Edward de Vere's signatures. Now, to show you how thoroughly I scoured Liverpool for Oxfordian materials, I even searched for them in a cavern deep underground. <laughs> I, I didn't find any Oxfordian documents there, but I did notice that almost everybody in the cavern was um, our age. <laughs> old, old enough to remember the time when the Beatles were still alive and still together. Now for something completely different. Many of you know that I live in Thailand. In my research, I discovered two linkages between Thailand and Shakespeare. First, the king of Thailand in 1922, Rama VII, contacted Sir Sidney Lee to request an advanced copy of the new edition of his Life of Shakespeare and to make a donation to Stratford-on-Avon. The king wrote that, I have been a very devout Shakespearean ever since I knew enough English to read him. And he added, I have read his works, every one of them at least twice, and several of them more times than I can remember. And yet I managed to find some fresh wonder and beauty every time I reread them. Sounds like us, doesn't it? Now, the king was overthrown in a coup 10 years after he wrote that letter. So it could be that for him, as for Prospero, his library was kingdom large enough, and he didn't pay attention to the political storms swirling around him. And second, on the right, while reading the Shakespeare pictorial, which, remember, ran an Oxfordian page in every issue for seven years, I came across an article about the Thai filmmaker who had made the silent film, Chang, Chang means elephant, um, in 1927. He had visited Stratford-on-Avon in 1928, and his visit had been noticed and written up in the pictorial. And now on to John Thomas Looney. I mentioned a moment ago that I spent several days in the Newcastle area where Looney lived and worked, and also visited his grandson, Alan Bodell, who lives in southern Scotland. On my first day in Newcastle, I went to look at the house where Looney lived from 1910 onwards, the place where he wrote Shakespeare Identified. 15 Laburnum Gardens is, you can see, in a row of townhouses. It's in a very pleasant neighborhood. The garage is in the back, and the front entrance is reached from a peaceful walkway. Each townhouse has a yard located directly in front of the townhouse across uh, the path. Here's a street level view. Looney's townhouse is the one with the green door, and there's the garden and, and uh, so on. Now, Looney's house is in the upper left uh, on this map, and in the lower right is the location of the Sheriff Hill Board School where Looney was deputy headmaster for many years, including the years during which he wrote Shakespeare Identified. I walked from the house to the field where the school used to be. It's about half a mile, maybe a bit longer. Uh, it took me about an hour because I kept stopping to look around. 
uh, but a determined walker could do it probably in 20 minutes. To the left of the house, off the image, is the Saltwell Cemetery where Looney is buried. So his grave is closer to his house than the school was. Here's a picture of the Sheriff Hill Board, Sheriff Hill Board School. It was the largest boarding school in Gateshead and had students up to age 14, which was the age at which schooling stopped in those days. I want to read you part of a letter that Looney wrote to Catherine Egger in 1936, which puts his work at the school in the right context. He wrote, I note that your first lecture makes reference to my scholastic vocation. Although I have no objection to it, it is not an aspect of my work which I should myself emphasize. The fact is that it is probably the most negligible part of my being and its contribution to my interests and mental makeup the least significant. If one may compare small things with great, it has been to me not unlike what tent making was for St. Paul. Uh, I have no doubt that the great apostle did this particular job conscientiously, but it does not represent the man himself in his dominant interests. So the phrases schoolmaster or school teacher don't quite do justice to Looney, and we need to find another phrase. While in Newcastle, I visited the Lit and Phil, the member-supported library open to the public where Looney did much of his Oxfordian research. On the right is a picture of the main room one of three large rooms filled with books. In the lower left-hand corner of that picture are our shelves with the library's newly acquired books. I was happy to see on it the centenary edition of Shakespeare Identified, down at the bottom, and Shakespeare Revealed, and the new edition of Esther Singleton's Shakespeare Fantasias, which I had sent to the library back in February. So they didn't toss them out, they put them on this shelf. From Newcastle, I drove up to Scotland to meet Looney's grandson, Alan Bodell, and Alan's daughter, Helen. I had a wonderful half day with them. After an hour and a half get to know each other conversation, we went out to lunch at a very pleasant outdoor restaurant near the Teviot River. It was truly a pleasure to meet them and to hear some stories from him about his grandfather. Here's one of them. It turns out that our Mr. Looney liked to read mystery novels by E. Phillips Oppenheim on the train. Books with titles such as The Great Secret, The Magnificent Hoax, and The Great Impersonation. <laughs> so, could it be that Looney was primed to write the book that John Galsworthy called the best detective story he had ever read by reading these mysteries? <laughs> so, <laughs> I went to see Alan Bodell, not just to meet him and not only to hear anecdotes about his grandfather, as enjoyable as those things were, but to get from him a case of his grandfather's papers that had been discovered only earlier this year. That this cage of papers survived and was discovered are themselves minor miracles. The papers had sat in the desk drawer um, in an unheated room on the top floor of a house in Hawick, Scotland, a small town of 14,000 people in an isolated part of the country for more than 50 years, ever since Alan and his wife Jean purchased the house in 1968. Before then, the same desk had sat in Alan's mother's house in Gateshead, England, unlooked in since, she, uh, since her death in 1952. Alan, now 85 years old, did not even know that the papers were in the desk. He discovered them only after the SOF's own Catherine Sharp asked if he had any additional photographs of his grandfather he'd be willing to share with us. It was in searching for photographs that he discovered the papers. Catherine, there you are, right there. <laughs> now, I had already been in correspondence with Alan, thanks to Catherine having introduced me to him. So once the papers had been discovered and Alan had indicated his willingness to pass them on to me, I went to Scotland to meet him and to get them from him. Here's what they looked like before I began to examine them. You can see there's 386 items totaling about 1,940 pages, about half of which are Oxfordian. Since the end of June, I have spent many hundreds of hours sorting and inventorying the papers and scanning them so that a permanent record of them will exist. The SOF is now in conversations or negotiations with a prestigious university library about housing them there so that they will be protected and available for scholars to examine. And here are the papers as I began to sort them out back in the hotel in Newcastle. 
they had a very strong mold smell, and I had to keep the air conditioning running all night long to be able to breathe. And after pulling out all the easy parts, all the letters and clippings, I was left with the difficult task of trying to sort out more than 200 pages of handwritten notes and man manuscripts. Some of them were clipped together, but most appeared to be in random order. It took a long time to try to match them up because some of them are hard to read, and Loney, Looney had the irritating practice of changing paper sizes, moving from, from pencil to ink, changing color of ink in the middle of articles. So it wasn't at all easy to try to match them up, and I'm still not done doing that. I'm also in the, print, uh, the, um, in, in the pro process of transcribing all of them, so we'll have them in digital form. Now, here's one example of how these papers begin to give us the context for incidents or publications we already know about. We've all seen this article by Looney in the Shakespeare Fellowship newsletter. The small print on it states that the following article is the reply by Mr. John Thomas Looney to a query from one of our members, Miss Lois Adelaide Book of Columbus, Indiana. Now we know from the papers I just showed you that Miss Book and Looney had been in correspondence for three years before she sent him a copy of Campbell's article and asked him what he thought of it. Okay, now let's talk about Shakespeare Identified. Here's a letter from Cecil Palmer to Looney in February 1920, 10 days before the book was released. Palmer wrote that, it is with very great pleasure that I am able to send your six presentation copies of Shakespeare Identified. You would have had them a day or two earlier, but for the fact that the whole office has been preoccupied with an immense amount of propaganda work in connection with the book. So Palmer was going all out to promote it, with review copies sent to all principal critics and all major bookstores in Great Britain, with ads placed in trade magazines and in the Times Literary Supplement. And in fact, his efforts to promote Looney's book were recognized. The publisher's circular commented that, it is always a good thing for an author when he can get his publisher to take a personal interest in his work, and from the preface to Mr. Looney's book, as well as from Palmer's letter to us, it is evident that he, Palmer, is convinced that Mr. L has discovered, uncovered, and covered with glory the name of Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. Now, we all know the story that all unsold copies of Shakespeare Identified were destroyed in 1940 in a bombing raid during the Blitz. And I, at least, had assumed that it was Cecil Palmer's warehouse that had been bombed. But it wasn't, and there's much more to the story before we get to the bombing. Cecil Palmer had filed for bankruptcy in May 1932. We know that from a Shakespeare Fellowship circular that Colonel Ward had sent out on June 30, 1932. And we know from another circular sent out by his son, because Colonel Ward had died, his son took over um, sending out the, um, the circulars, that books were finally available again in April 1935. So the book was not available for purchase for a period of almost three years during the 1930s. So why did Cecil Palmer go bankrupt? He had published 28 books on Shakespeare from 1920 to 1932, including more than a dozen of the first Oxfordian books. Could it be that publishing so many Oxfordian books was a cause, even the primary cause, of his bankruptcy? We've already seen the extensive efforts, probably very expensive, that the company undertook to promote Looney's book. And now we have a letter Palmer wrote to Looney on July 3rd, 1923, which says, in part, My dear Looney, very many thanks for your letter. I am very glad you liked both Colonel Ward's book and Captain Holland's. Both, I think, should eventually help our case considerably, but it is wretchedly slow work and as difficult as ever to persuade folk to read books on the subject. So it, the book and the author never had an easy time. Um, and there's much more to the story. It turns out that at that moment of crisis in his life, at the time of the impending bankruptcy of his company, Cecil Palmer engaged in some tricky legal maneuvering and took several unethical actions that harmed Looney and the other writers whose books he had published, including Ava Turner Clark, who lost all unsold copies of her book uh, handled in England by Palmer. We know about these things now in part because of this letter that Looney wrote to the legal firm handling the bankruptcy proceedings. The lawyers had told Looney that all inventory of Shakespeare identified would be remaindered, dumped, or destroyed unless Looney himself paid the bills due Palmer's creditors. 
Looney responded in this letter by saying, first, let me refer to the possible, legal, possible sale as remainders of the existing stocks of the books and the possible legal action for damages, which, according to the judgment in the James V. Grant Richard case, would be the normal consequence of such sale. In other words, Looney was saying that you do not have the right to remainder the books, and if you do remainder them, then I will launch legal action against you, and he cites a legal precedent in support of his position. And there's still more to the story, even apart from this aspect of the legal morass. Although Cecil Palmer's company had reached the point of bankruptcy, the firm had made money on Shakespeare Identified. It had sold enough copies in England to recoup all expenses, and Palmer, as Looney's agent, had received royalties for him from the American publisher of the book. But Palmer didn't pass those American royalties on to Looney. Instead, he pocketed them just as he kept the royalties for all the copies sold in England, thereby cheating Looney out of his royalties earned in both countries. Further, just before the bankruptcy, Palmer dumped 500 copies of Shakespeare Identified, sold them off at a cheap price and pocketed those proceeds too, thereby defrauding both Looney and his own company. Now, I don't bring all these facts to light lightly, but they have, been, they have significantly, significantly complicated my view of Palmer, from that of a crusader on behalf of Looney's book to something very different uh, a decade later. And there's still more to the story. After Looney got the unsold copies of the book back into his possession, he looked for and found an international bookseller willing to market the books in the UK and the US. But almost immediately after transferring all the books to the bookseller, the bookseller was deported from England. This was near the end of the 1930s, the Second World War had begun, and the bookseller was German. Looney then found another bookseller, Leonard Hyman, who would market the books, but there was more bad luck. Soon after the books were transferred to Hyman's warehouse in London, Fleet Street, where the warehouse was located, was destroyed by German bombing and the Blitz. So it was in Leonard Hyman's warehouse that the uh, books were destroyed. Looney later filed an insurance claim, only to find out that the bookseller hadn't purchased insurance. So he ended up receiving nothing for the 1920 English and American editions of his book. The story wasn't much prettier in the United States. The book was published by Frederick Stokes in May 1920. In October, five months later, Stokes wrote to Looney saying that the book is going rather slowly at present, but interest may again revive. Well, interest apparently did not revive because Stokes later remaindered the book. The company dumped all unsold copies of the US edition and took it out of print. And as we have seen, the royalties for the copies that had been sold were pocketed by Cecil Palmer. There were similar unpleasant developments regarding the 1948 U.S. edition, but I will skip over those. Returning to June 1920. Shakespeare Identified had been reviewed in the New York Times by John Corbin. Looney wrote a letter in response, and Stokes attempted to place it with the paper. Here's what he wrote to Looney about that. I have not yet succeeded in getting publication for your reply to Mr. Corbin. The Times declined to print it without giving reasons. The New York Evening Post and the New York Tribune refused it because they did not want to appear to be criticizing a rival paper. A decade later, in 1932, Looney submitted uh, an article to the Atlantic Monthly, which rejected it, writing, Dear Mr. Looney, we fear the Atlantic is too old to change its opinions regarding the authorship of Shakespeare's works. <laughs> So Looney didn't have any success in getting letters or articles published in the closed-minded American media. There's much more to tell you about all that, but I have to begin to wrap things up. So to sum up my activities and findings for the past year, whoops, wrong computer. I visited 10 sites in eight places in England and spent 40 days in actual research plus travel days between cities. All this work produced a mass of materials. After each significant round of research over the past four years, not just the past year, whether in online databases, libraries in the United States, or libraries and archives in England, my findings looked something like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but 10 times as many pieces. Uh, so the amount of material was almost overwhelming. I have been slowly but surely bringing some kind of order to it. Here's what it looks like now. These are my working files of the things that I've found. So these 40 binders contain almost 8,000 items, totaling almost 20,000 pages. 
All this is in addition to books and in addition to the Shakespeare Fellowship newsletters and quarterlies. Now, to bring all this information and these documents out in an orderly way, I'm working on several projects. For the Oxfordian items in the archives, I've prepared this report, Oxfordian Archives in England. This is what the introduction looks like. Um, which is a database of the 2,400 pieces of Oxfordian ephemera at Brunel University, the University of London, and the University of Liverpool. The database itself is in Excel and can be sorted by archive, box number, book number, date, author, title, and type of item. If you'd like a copy, just send me an email and I'll send one to you. Eventually I'll post this to a website where it can be accessed. I'll put this out on the, on the table. Uh, my email address is on the second page. I'm also working on a chronological listing of every Oxfordian event, Oxfordian publication, and Oxfordian letter from the first 25 years of the Oxfordian movement, 1920 to 1945. It's already 130 pages long, and I'm not done yet. And I'm working on a book. I have a copy right here, Shakespeare Investigated. This is a collection of Oxfordian correspondence during the first quarter century of the Oxfordian movement. I know about 500 letters sent between Oxfordians, and I have more than 400 of them, either originals or photocopies or photographs. More than half of them are either to or from Looney. So I've divided them into 14 sections, and I'm writing introductions to each section. So these letters, supplemented by my introductions, will tell the story of the first decades of the Oxfordian movement in the words of the people who actually participated in it. So it's about 500 pages long. Uh, there's one letter after another after another. But it's, they're, they're fascinating to get a firsthand look of what was going through their minds, what information were they sharing with each other during those 25 years. Now that book is the third of four Shakespeare, in quotation marks, books that I'm bringing out. The first was the centenary edition of Shakespeare Identified. The second one was Shakespeare Revealed with 53 shorter uh, items published by Looney after Shakespeare Identified. The third was the, the book of letters. And the fourth will be Shakespeare Explained, which will have the full text introduced and annotated of about 370 shorter pieces that the Shakespeare Fellowship published outside of its own newsletters. Then, drawing on all this material, I'm in the process of putting all the pieces together to write two books. One is about Shakespeare identified in the effect it has had in the world, and the other is a biography of the man who wrote it. In the first book, I'll be trying, in part, to understand why Looney was successful in identifying the true author of the Shakespeare works when others hadn't been, and also why the Oxfordian idea hadn't immediately conquered the world. Now, why didn't it gain immediate acceptance? And I'll show in that book the relevance for understanding what happened 1920 to 1945 for those of us carrying on the struggle for recognition of Oxford's authorship today. Although I don't have time to go into the contents of these books any more deeply than that, I want to mention one point, one observation that I've made so far, and that is this, that progress in advancing the Oxfordian claim can be viewed in more than one way. One way would be to compare the number of people who knew of Oxford's authorship in 1919 with those who know today. In 1919, only one person knew of De Vere's authorship. Today, millions do. But before we congratulate ourselves on the progress we've made, consider this alternative view of the situation. It could be that progress, uh, the progress that has been made in advancing the Oxfordian claim was mostly made uh, by 1939. Oh, here we are. A case could be made that before the Second World War shut everything down in England, uh, the major lines of Oxfordian research were already set and most major discoveries already made. Stratfordian responses were already set with academia and academic publications already closed to the Oxfordian idea. The practice of the media taking its lead from Stratfordians and not Oxfordians was already set. A case could be made that we aren't much closer now than we were 80 years ago to our achieving to achieving our ultimate goal of having Shakespeare taught in the schools as a pen name uh, for Oxford, just as Mark Twain is taught as a pen name for Samuel Longhorn Clemens. Uh, 
In support of that conclusion, the Shakespeare Fellowship had at least as many impressive academic members in 1940 as it does today. Here's a list of some of them. Note that the libraries at Harvard, Yale, UPenn, and the University of Michigan were all dues-paying members of the SF in 1940. I don't think that any of them are today. All this information is from two letters that Charles Wisner Burrell sent to Looney in 1940. In the second letter, Burrell specifically mentions Charlton Ogburn, General Counsel for the American Federation of Labor, thereby linking the past, Looney, the present, Burrell, and the future, Ogburn, in one letter. That letter is part of the papers I got from Looney's grandson. But there's still so much more research to be done. The archives of prominent Oxfordians must be found, and the archives of prominent Stratfordians and Baconians must be searched for the letters that I know Looney wrote to them because I have their letters to him. I'm already on the trail of these papers and have, hope to have much to report about them next year. I want to close by telling you about one of the earliest American Oxfordians, Margaret L. Knapp. On the left, you can see that she was in correspondence with Looney as early as November 1920. The letter I marked in blue, June 6, 1921, I'll put a stack of them on the table out front to give you a sense of just how substantive her letters to Looney were. And on the right, you can see that she wrote an article about Shakespeare and Mark Twain in 1941. Now, I saved Margaret Knapp for last, <clears throat> because she lived in Hartford, Connecticut. And not just in Hartford, <coughs> but right across the street from where we are today. We're here in the Mark Twain house. Her house is down there at 422 Farmington Avenue. Later she moved uh, to a house on Lorraine Street uh, just off the map. So there you have it. One year and one hour. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>